welcome to Circling Dialogos and my riffing and commenting on A.H. Almas's Pearl Beyond Price. So I am uh, sitting right now in, um, in Dallas, Texas. I'm here doing some business and visiting my son. So I'm at an Airbnb and I've got a kind of jerry-rigged situation where I have my green screen in the back, kind of like kind of propped up on a mirror that's kind of barely holding up. And I'm your the computer that I'm using is sitting on top of a toaster to get it even. So I have situations that are kind of precarious, but hopefully our deep experience with being and it's um its ability for genuine, um, flexible autonomy can come through here. All right. So I want to pick up reading here pretty quickly, but just to summarize where we are, right? So, so Almas is, is basically entering into a dialectic, right? Um, and, and in this dialectic, showing inconsistencies, right, and, and synergies, yet an unintegration, right, so far in psychology and in spirituality, right, which between the world of psychology and what he's calling the, the man of the spirit or spirituality, right, where the spirituality basically says that the true reality is being, the false reality is um, images, Ego is a mental phenomena based on, um, you know, pictures and memories and uh, bodily patterns. And that, 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 that ego and those images and those self-concepts um, are not the real deal, right? And in spirituality, you want to dissolve those so that you can become identified with being your true nature, right? Whereas psychology doesn't have a, it doesn't have a real, uh, uh, any sense of being. So what it basically does is it is it like like the the man of the of the spirit, the man of the world, right? Only knows about themselves via inference through some kind of representation or image, right? So therefore, since psychology has no other horizon that's open to it other than mental phenomena, right? They view emotional health and what's possible being the adjustment of this self-image, the gaining a healthy ego, a healthy self-image, right? Um, having it be more realistic. And their inter interventions and the context that they come from is all about that because they don't have a sense of a horizon, right? that goes beyond it. Therefore, they don't account for it. And Almas is basically saying, bringing these two things into a dialectic, right? And Almas is kind of, so far, is basically saying that both have something right and both have something um, incomplete, right? In that, I think Almas is going to say, you know, he's basically through the question of, okay, if the man of the spirit says that the ego and identifying with the ego based on memory is illusion and that basically we need to dissolve it, right? So that we can become identified with being the true reality. How come then everyone has an ego? How come everyone that's born ends up forming an ego? has mental representations, right? Has a mind, right? Identifies with its contents. It's like, is, is that like, you know, did, you know, did God hiccup or burp at just the right time and therefore everyone is embodying this mistake? Um, so he questions, and in other ways, he questions this assumption about the ego and the, the valence, the negative valence that is often put in spirituality on this, right? Um, and says that actually, I think what he's inviting us to consider is that the ego is actually um, 
a incomplete picture or an incomplete phenomena of something that's actually true about being, right? That, that within being has an aspect, right? That affords something like autonomy, let's say, right? That it's formed something like a self, that, that these are qualities of being, right? That are like the platonic forms of what we call a self or an ego or autonomy normally in psychology. And that, that, that the mistake is that psych psychology doesn't have an account of being, therefore it can't relate to it. But also on the other side, spirituality um, misses the boat in this regard because it just discounts things like egos and selves and all this kind of stuff. And it kind of throws, it throws all that out and you get this dualism, right? Within, within um, the man of the spirit. So ego, so I, I think, I think Almas is coming along saying, no, actually both of these, right? When we bring them into a dialectic, right? Can transform into something more complete. And he's now in the part of the book where he's going into more um, case studies, if you will, of, of working with his students. Okay, so I'm just going to dive in. All right. Okay, we are on page 103. I'm going to actually start at the top of the page, um, the second sentence here, and we'll go from there. Alma says, the basic accomplishment is experiencing oneself as a separate individual based on a self-image composed of memory. So the, the accomplishment is autonomy. Um, and the via, I think the self-image is what he's referencing this. So the basic accomplish, accomplishment is experiencing oneself as a separate individual based on, on a self-image composed of memories. From the perspective of the man of spirit, however, one is actually a being independent from mind, existing outside the field of memory. From this perspective, the accomplishment of ego autonomy is ultimately a prison. In identifying with the self-image constructed through the process of ego development, we cage ourselves. How can this be autonomy, this bondage, which is the primary source of human suffering? So you can see him kind of, you know, questioning in this, in this sense the, the, the grounds of psychology. Only when, when development, when, only when developmental psychology takes into consideration the fact that the nature of man is being will a true understanding of autonomy emerge. Again, we know that its perspective is not incorrect, only limited. A similar limitation is seen sometimes on the side of the man of spirit. Some people actually seek out the impersonal levels of being in order to avoid dealing with the issues of autonomy, which must be faced in order ordinary ego development as well as in, in the development of spiritual, of, of, of the personal essence. When one does have the experience of ceasing to identify with the self-image and simply be, it is clear that the autonomy of ego is a sham, since the ego personality is perceived not only as ephemeral, a kind of surface phenomena, which is in the nature of an idea, but also as reactive responding automatically to the world from being, which is felt as the true and solid reality. Ego's individuality is seen as simply a dark network composed of beliefs in the mind and the patterns of tension in the body. And again, I keep thinking about this, like I think what psychology doesn't seem to ask is if, if being a self, right is a is a, derives from these mental representations these self images 
what is it that identifies with it, right? What is it that, what comes to know itself as this, as this picture of itself, right? What is that? What makes that possible? And who is that, right? And how, and also how, how come we don't identify with the couch? We can make rep, rep, mental representations of like everything. How come we don't identify with the picture frame, right? Or your, or your toenail? How come whatever it is that identifies, it seems to know to identify with the self image, right? With the body, with all these things that we've come to understand is where we're located in some sense. How does it know that, right? These are kind of, these are questions that keep coming through my mind as we're reading. Okay, we go on. Alma says, thus the supposed autonomy of ego is from this perspective, nothing but the, but, but the feeling that accompanies an image in its relation to another image. It is striking that this is exactly what objects relations theory states, that autonomy is based on the establishment of a self-image. We wonder how one can know that what he believes he is, is simply an image. And stop at that without feeling that something is not right? Great question. This thing that we don't know yet, right, that identifies with self-image, right, whatever that is, how come it doesn't ask, how come we stop at just a self-image? How come we don't ask questions like, who is, who is that that's identifying with this picture of this young, young, dapper, good-looking um, uh, uh, young man here in this video? Why is, how, how come he only identifies with his, you know, youthful looks? I joke. He goes on. The answer, of course, is that as long as one identifies with the self-image, the implications of the theory are not suspected. Or if they are suspected, they cannot be clearly seen without an experience of being. One must go through a very deep process of inner transformation to see the profound implications of this apparently simple understanding of ego identity. Another reason most people cognizant of objects relations theory do not see its deeper shocking implication is the fact that they are usually focused on mental disorders and that norm that in that normality and health are generally viewed in relation to pathology. Since the pathologies are in general, ultimately due to the absence of complete ego autonomy, ego, ego autonomy has come to represent health in our, come to re, ego autonomy has come to represent health or normality. And, and I would also add to that, that health is kind of viewed as in some sense, it's kind of negatively viewed, right? In psychology. Psychology has a tendency to view like um, psychological health as the absence of pathology. If you notice like not many psychologies have a well formed out map, map of what is a thriving self, right? It's more focused on how does it go wrong? And therefore, what ends up happening is, you know, psychology has, um, doesn't have much of an account for what positively is a healthy ego, for example. It's usually like, well, it's, it's the absence of pathology. That's in there too, somehow. Okay, Almas goes on. We can see here, However, that objects relations theory does by its, by its very defining of ego as a mental structure and image, which achieves some sort of autonomy, point to some other reality, which is not image. We believe that objects relations theory will in fact someday expand to include 
in include consideration of being. This has already been hinted at in the work of W. W. Or I'm sorry, D. W. Wincott and Harry Guntrip. Wincott, a British psychoanalysis psychoanalyst, relates being to the inherited potential of the human infant in his discussion of the infant in his human environment. He says, quote, in this place, which is characterized by the essential existence of a holding environment, the inherited potential is becoming itself as a continuity of being. A continuity of being, quote unquote. The alternative to being is reacting and reacting interrupts being and annihilates. Being and annihilation are the two alternatives. And that's by Wincott from the book, The Maturation Process and the uh, Facilitating Environment. Clearly, Wincott holds being as, a, as central for human development and is quite definite that being is the opposite of reacting. As we will elaborate later, this accords with our point of view. It is unfortunate that many of the concepts of this eminent psychologist have been, have been incorporated into the mainstream of objects relations theory while this emphasis on being has been completely ignored. We know of only one exception, Guntrip, who saw its implications and included it in his theory and practice. He writes clearly about the importance of being. Okay, so before I, I read that, so, you know, it's interesting, but, you know, it, you could say, so, so this guy Wincott, right, has a sense of being, right, as central. Now, what he means by being, I'm not sure. It has something to do with continuity of potential. And it's really interesting that the opposite of that is a reactivity, which is connected with annihilation. I mean, I hope we go into that more. But so for Wincott as an individual, right, the sense of being, right, is a horizon that in some sense is open for Wincott. However, as a field, right, the, the psychology, psychology's that horizon of being is confiscated, right? I think it, this, this really plays into, you know, Heidegger's, I, I, you know, I think Heidegger would agree here that this is, that this is another symptom, if you will, or expression of, the Western, the Western metaphysics as the forgetfulness of being, right? So maybe it's this forgetfulness of being as such, right? That in metaphysics, that is the that is the ground for psychology's expression of it being not recognizing it, even when it's one of its prominent founders and contributors is explicitly say, saying being, the field incorporates so much of Wincott, but it leaves out being, right? It's probably because this horizon is not open to it, which probably has deep implications in, you know, in the Heideggerian sense of the understanding of Western metaphysics as the loss of the question of being and the forgetfulness of being. It's kind of demonstrated right here one of the places it's demonstrated. Okay, so I'll, I'll read this quote. An absence, non-realization or dissociation of the experience of being and of the possibility of it, and along with that, incapacity for healthy, natural, spontaneous doing is the most radical clinical phenomena, phenomenon in analysis. He writes further about the importance of the experience of being for all human development. He goes on, I quote, the experience of being is the beginning and basis 
for the realization of the potentialities in our raw human nature for for developing as a person in personal relationships. He writes further about the, the importance of the experience of being for all human development. Quote, the experience of being is the beginning and the basis for the realization of the potentialities in our raw human nature for developing as a person in personal relationships. Right. So, you know, I think he's, he's, he's kind of stating in some sense, the obviousness of this that's overlooked, right. In the, the, the whole of psychology, right. Which is, you know, there is, there is a being of, there is something that has presence, right. And this presence is innately um, carries these potentiality for being right. If they weren't there, right. How can we explain the way that they come into being in relationships, right. With, with the holding environment, with the parents and the caregivers, right? If this, if this creature didn't have a being, right, that had these potentialities for language and thinking and memory and emotional attachment and all of these things, right? If there wasn't someone there, right? <laughs> how could it form an image, right? Through, through itself and other people in these psychodynamic relationships. In some sense, this is just kind of obvious, yet overlooked. Okay, almost goes on. Although they made being a central concept in their theories, Wincott and Guntrip did not pursue the implications of the contrast between being and ego, nor did they conduct a direct exploration of being itself. The concept of being is, of course, present in other psychologies, such as existential psychology. However, we do not discuss them here because our approach is quite different, and in particular, because our approach is psychodynamic, while these psychologies are generally not, right? So, you know, Almas's approach, right, or the Diamond Heart approach, right, is all about this deep investigation and inquiry into um not just saying that right being is important but it's so important right that that it's got a depth that can open up and come to be more deeply understood and embodied right through inquiry through investigation he goes on in our work on the realization of being we have found a consistent pattern that dealing with the issue of autonomy always leads to the experience of personal essence. This is true for all students ha who, who have undergone an uh, appreciable segment of the process. The case of Sandy above was a good example of this pattern. In work based on objects relations theory, the guide or therapist might work on the issues around autonomy, the feelings involved, life situations affected, and perhaps then deal with the genesis of these in terms of the patient's relations with the primary love objects in early childhood. The, fo the focus there is on supporting the ego structure so that the individuality will gain more autonomy. Gertrude and um, Ruben Blank Blanc, for instance, consider the function of the psychotherapist to be, in part, the guardianship of autonomy. Quote, by guardianship, we mean that even at the point when the patient telephones for his first appointment, the therapist has in mind that this person is to be helped, is to be helped to leave in a state of independence of independence someday, that he is not independent 
at the outset is one of the factors that bring him into therapy. That, that he becomes dependent upon the therapist need not be feared. That he grows increasingly independent as therapy proceeds is the result of the therapist's professional use of himself to promote growth. In our work, almost goes on, in our work on self-realization, we do much the same thing. But rather than looking at, looking only at the cognitive and emotional aspects of the situation, we focus on the actual existential presence or absence of the state of autonomy. We consistently find that when the student experiences a state of autonomy, it is related to a sense of being that arises just at that moment. The student then experiences a pal palpable presence, a state of fullness, strength, and wholeness, which make him feel autonomous and authentically himself. The presence of fullness is usually identified as one, as who one is, as opposed to identification with an image or, a, or emotional state. From this, we see that true autonomy is simply the capacity to be the personal essence, one's fullness of being, the sense of freedom, independence, autonomy, indiv indiv individuation is experienced at such times as a very clear, precise, and certain fact. There is no vagueness or uncertainty about autonomy when one recognizes the personal essence as one's true being. You know, I have to say that this is, this really rings in my experience of circling, right, as well, you know, and this is why having a, a, the, like the, the understanding and the distinctions um, that you have matter in how you perceive what occurs for you and what doesn't occur for you, and thus how you relate with what occurs for you. If you don't have the horizon of being open to you, right, you're not going to be able to ask a question like when someone says, you know, say they have some distortion, they realize some projection that they, they have on the therapist, um, and that has to do with a certain dependency on the therapist and they see this projection and in seeing it, something resolves, right? Where they actually see that they're different than the therapist and that they, that the therapist isn't their father who they realize that they're projection projecting on. They withdrew that. They had a moment where they withdrew that from the therapist, recognize why they had that projection and have this insight, but also a feeling of fullness, a sense of autonomy, a felt facticity of beingness, right? That's full and verbose, let's say. If the therapist, right, um, doesn't have an understanding of being or a limited one, it can't ask the question, what is it that you're experiencing right there, right now? I notice your chest is expanding. Let's let that, let's let, let that be there. Right? What does it feel like? What's the texture of it? Right? There's a whole dimension of inquiry and exploration that can open up to you because the horizon of being, right, is open. Therefore, it can occur to the therapist. But because it doesn't occur for the therapist, right, the therapist is going to be more associated with kind of intellectual conceptualization and understanding that and won't even notice necessarily the experience that the client is going through or won't realize its significance, which it turns out is the most significant part of it, right? It's one of the things I appreciate about circling is in some sense, you know, in circling, we say that the that the, 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 attention, the intention of a circle is very simple. It's we're all practicing profoundly being with what is. And because circling 
has a sense of is that's dynamic, full, right? Um, this, the, the horizon of being, right, is explicitly open. When somebody has an experience of insight or recognizes something, the question is often asked, like, well, what is, like, what is that experience like? What's happening right now in your body? What are you feeling, right? And, and we want to open up what is because our understanding of what is, is deep and dimensional. Okay, it goes on. The issue of continuing to do the work in the group as opposed to go off on one's own, frequently arises when this issue of autonomy develops in the student's process. Mm. Wait a minute, did I skip something? Yeah, I think I skipped this. From this we see, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go to the top of the page. From this we see that true autonomy is simple, is simply the capacity to be the personal essence, one's fullness of being. The sense of freedom, independence, autonomy, and individuation is experienced at such times as a very clear, precise, and certain fact. There is no vagueness or uncertainty about autonomy when one recognizes the personal essence as one's true being. So in other words, you know, when you experience, experience, experientially, feel, sense, experience directly the fact of the fullness, let's say, of the personal essence, right? That is unarguable, right? That is, you don't have to like, you don't have to convince yourself of anything, right? There's a sense of, no, I am in fact feeling this sense of fullness in my chest and it's, it's expanding and it's clearing my head. And um, it's bringing more realizations, which is increasing the sense of expansion, right? And this is altering how I perceive and I'm perceiving so much more. This is all, these are all things that aren't like analytical cognitive abstractions. These are a direct encounter with the very center of yourself, right? It's, it's the fact as you emphasized, the facticity of what you're confronting. Right. Now, of course, we could say that's going to affect our conceptual picture of ourselves, right? That that is going to update, if you will, this these kind of inferior or dependent self images that maybe I have floating around in there. That I I can imagine that deeply affects my picture of myself. But the picture isn't the source of it. I think that's the point. Okay, so almost goes on. The issue of continuing to do the work in the group as opposed to going off on one's own frequently arises when issues of autonomy of autonomy develops in the student's process. As we have noted, the essential states which are coming up in the student's development usually manifest at, at first as a sense of their absence. The student will then tend to resort to his habitual ways of dealing with the lack, which in the case of autonomy might be asserting, asserting his independence, which will often involve acting out or at least strongly desiring to act out by leaving the group or leaving some other situation. In the case of Sandy, it manifested as conflicts about being in the group, right? So in other words, you know, in terms of the personal essence and in a lot, and I would imagine a lot of qualities of beingness that when we are cut off from them for whatever reason, we're left with this hole, right? Or this experience of lack or a sense of inadequacy or nullity, right? And then that's when all of our psychological, psychodynamic patterns emerge right where we'll we'll start to um we'll start to unconsciously try to attempt to have a corrective experience right to fill this gap that's missing 
from my experience of being and try and try to mimic it through the environment, right? Through some conflict or some situation where I assert my autonomy, right? But all of that is based on the lack, the, the lack of my connection to being. Therefore, the very act of, of, of asserting my autonomy already admits of this lack, right? He goes on. Dealing with this issue requires careful perception on the part of the teacher who must see the situation for what it is in order to deal properly with the student's desire for autonomy and thus allow him to experience the personal essence. There's always some negative behavior or attitude on the part of the student, similar to the, the behaviors Mahler observed in the subphases of practicing and reapproachment. Even when the teacher understands the situation, the student might still terminate the process before completion, surrendering to the lure of autonomy. When this process is broken off prematurely, the individual goes off doing things in his life which he believes are autonomous, while in reality, he is only covering up a big hole a state of deficiency, which is the absence of the personal essence. Even when the student has experienced this state, he might terminate prematurely if he has not fully recognized the personal essence for, for what it is, or not fully, fully dealt with the area of lack connected with this aspect, which, which are many and deep. Thus, the student might experience the personal essence, but not recognize or accept it as his, his true being, but rather take it to be an effect of some psychological, some, some uh, physiological or psychological state. So in other words, um, the student may actually have an experience of the personal essence, but not understand it correctly and then sum it up to just a passing state, right? Or some physiological something or other, and therefore not be able to integrate the experience. So almost goes on. This, this usually indicates the presence of strong defenses against real autonomy. One such case is a businesswoman who did private work with the author for about a year and a half. Towards the end of this period, she was dealing with issues of separation and autonomy with her boyfriend and also with her job. In most of her life situations, especially with men, she acted out a dependent and submissive role. As a, as a result of her work with me, she was becoming stronger in her relationship with her boyfriend, asserting herself and making independent moves. She was promoted in her job, was more um, with more responsibility and autonomy. At some point, she began to experience the fullness of the personal essence in, in her belly, which she liked, but was still but was still full of anger and resentment about how she had been treated in her more dependent days. A few weeks after this development, she decided to terminate, feeling that she was now strong enough to go, to go her own separate way. She was then much stronger than when she started but was not even close to integrating the personal essence in any permanent way. Clearly, she was acting out her need for autonomy rather than working through the issues surrounding it. It is likely that she was afraid that if she really attained her autonomy, she would lose her relationship with her boyfriend. She left believing she was gaining her freedom when the fact was that sh she had had a taste of freedom, a taste that frightened her and made her leave and thus fail to integrate 
fully the state of autonomy. In our experience, students who had in their childhood strong disruptions and conflicts in the process of separation and individuation are the ones who tend to abort the process of development around the time when personal essence is arising in consciousness. This is another pattern that illustrates the connection between personal essence and autonomy. Let's see. So, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, I've definitely seen this in my work a lot, right? Where when the source the source of these issues around autonomy start to open up and they start to have an experience of genuine autonomy that becomes possible. Before integrating it, that experience of genuine autonomy, right, can actually become deeply threatening to them. Right. And you say, you, you go, well, why is that? Wouldn't you think the opposite that this experience of the personal essence and this feeling of fullness, this ontological sense of autonomy, distinction via authentic being, that, that would resolve things? That wouldn't be threatening. That would be good. However, if you think about it, right? One's life and the structure that supports that life is a structure built on who one is and has been. Therefore, in some sense, like just consider that, that you've trained all the people that are in your life consistently, you've trained them how to be with you. You've trained them to, right, to, 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 to be in certain kinds of conflicts with you and avoid certain things with you and all, all of these things that, that um, the people in your life are the people that can accommodate for your way of being. And therefore, if this new kid on the block called being shows up in your life and you start to not need those conflicts, you start to not need people in the way that you needed them before, you have more of an authentic experience of yourself. Well, then you, you're starting to look at relationships that, that, that now have a different basis that could be really threatening to you, right? Um, thus, if you really integrate this sense of autonomy or the personal essence, well, what about the relationships that are based on, um, that are based on a dynamic of you not being autonomous? right? There's all these issues that come up, right? And it's those issues that become threatening enough such that people say, fuck it, I'm out of here. All right, I'll go for another couple paragraphs. Almost goes on. Another student, Anna, who had a, a very str long struggle with his, with his issue of independence. Every time there was a movement towards autonomy, which manifested as success in her life, such as a better job or a good opportunity, she would become physically ill. Finally, she was able to recognize her personal essence as her true being and identity. However, she reacted with the usual negative separation seeking feelings, and behavior. She missed se several group sessions. However, because she worked on the issue hard and long and was truly, was truly desperate about needing her autonomy, she managed to work out some of the issues herself and return to complete her work. Here is a report of a part of her process. All right, my son just got here, so I haven't seen him in a while. So I'm going to complete this video and I look forward to picking it up. Thank you again for joining me as always and uh, more to come.